Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the first thing I want to say is, what is a rabbi? Is anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, a rabbi is someone who talks about God. Yeah, a rabbi connected to God. Like those of you who go to church, you have a, who leads your your churches? Uh, what's the person called? A priest or a pastor. So that's the, the spiritual leader of the congregation, right? Everybody with me? That's what I do for the Jewish community. So for Jewish people in the Jewish religion, rabbi means teacher. That's what rabbi means. So I'm here as your teacher. And I want to tell you, what does this whole program come to? It's one thing. So everybody will know, everybody will be clear. What am I holding in my hand? What does that look like? Yes. Looks like some sort of rock. Yeah, a pebble, a rock. And when you take a, a pebble like this, and I love to go by the pond near my house, and I go like this, and I throw it all in the water, what happens after it skips? What does it create? In the water. What does it create in the water? Ripples, correct, right? When you skip a rock on the water, you have ripples. And we're here today for one reason, is to understand the ripples like we were throwing a pebble on the water of history. Because history has its own ripples. You're in the fifth grade, right? Yeah. And you've been studying World War II, right? World War II, which was a war that the Americans and the British and the French and Australians all fought against the Germans, the Japanese, and particularly, if you've been studying about World War II and Germany and Nazism, and I'm here to tell you that today's lesson is about understanding the ripple effect of history, just like you throw in the water, that still exists today. That history isn't something that's just in a book. History affects people's lives today. And the folks that we have brought together from my congregation and the Jewish community understand and are, we're, we're really affected by those ripples to this very day. So the first thing I want you to know is that in Germany in 1942, 1941, the Germans decided in their effort to destroy people that they didn't like and murder people, sadly, very sadly, they created a world where if you weren't like them, you would be put to death. This is a very difficult subject to talk to 10 year olds about. But I think you're mature 10 year olds, is that fair to say? Okay, so it's serious business. And we're here to talk about those ripple effects and to say that you can't even imagine how many people can be killed by a government. But you can understand one person. You can understand the struggle, the struggles of one person or two people. So we're here to see a video about how Germany's Nazis, and that's something that you're familiar with because you've been studying this. And you'll continue to study this when you actually get older and older, how they impacted people in this room. In this room, who are children, who are, and who are grandchildren, and we even have one special guest who is Mrs. Vera Hoffman, who is a really cool lady. And Mrs. Hoffman is going to, we're going to have a little conversation. And she, <clears throat> even though she's quiet now, she's really a pretty talkative lady. And she actually has been through and lived in and survived the Nazis and the concentration camps. So don't look at her only as somebody that looks like your grandmother. Look at her as though she was 12 years old or 13 years old, just like a little older than you, when she went through something very, very horrible. <coughs> Yet 
she survived. So, would you like to say good morning to Mrs. Hoffman? Good morning, Mrs. Hoffman. Okay, now let me introduce you to this gentleman. He's widely known throughout the, the low country. He's one of the coolest dudes around, okay? When you smile. So, this is Stephen Nagel. I think he's really a cool guy. And I asked him to, to uh, wear his uniform because Stephen Nagel was born in Hungary, just like Vera Hoffman. Steve Nagel was a child, and he grew up, and in about 1956, Steve Nagel and his family literally ran across the fields of Hungary because there was a war, a revolution. And this was their chance to get freedom. And he, his father, dragged this little 10 year old, 12 year old kid. He doesn't look like that, but that's what he was. They dragged him to Austria, they dragged him here, they dragged him there. They were immigrants, they were refugees, meaning they fleed for their life. And eventually the Nadels came to America. And you know what he did to say thank you to America? He spent the rest of his career serving the United States Army. So that's why I wanted him to wear this uniform. And he's going to show you some of the, what would we call, artifacts from the world of Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, Germany. Real life stuff, which he has collected over the years. And the third person I want to introduce is Felicia Roth. It's Felicia Roth. What is Felicia Roth? She's a mom. She's a mom. She's not as old as them. So what is she doing here? She has a story to tell too. Her grandparents, ripple effect, were also in the concentration camps. The concentration camps that killed six million Jews? Six million? That's like twice the population of the state. But not all people, not only Jews who were killed, many others. And so this is the ripple effect of history that we're trying to teach you. So that's why we're here today. And that is to learn about history and that it's not just something for boring books, as they say. I don't think books are boring, but I think that history is about what happens to us. And each and every one of you has a history, too. And I'll bet you that your great-grandparents, like my father, fought in World War II somehow, some way. Fought against the Nazis. Because at that time, the whole country was united to fight the Nazis. <coughs> So we don't want to forget the truth. We want to remember the truth. So the first thing we're going to do today is to see a story about Helga's story, right? We're going to see an excerpt from a woman who will tell exactly what happened to her. And then I'm going to introduce Vera. And will I be able to ask some questions? And Felicia, Steve Nadell will give his presentation. And then we're going to have a special ceremony and present for all of you. You got a present just for being here. And this is the first time that this presentation is being done in the entire Low Country. No other school, no other school except your school is having this experience. So you are first unique. Let's begin. Dad were sitting by the radio. I bet you're thinking to yourself, well, I'd like to see the rest of it, wouldn't you? What happened? I know. I know. Obviously, her daddy was taken to Auschwitz concentration camp, which is a camp that did one thing. I know it's unbelievable. Who can think of it? You don't have to be 10 years old to 
say, I don't get it. I, at my age, I still don't understand. It killed maybe up to about one and a half billion people through the gas chambers. Very, very difficult, very sad. Her parents were killed. She survived. And that's why she's telling the story. Let me also say that listening is very important too because people who come from Europe, particularly Helga who came from Czechoslovakia, have accents. So it's something you and I are not necessarily used to, so we have to listen carefully. So I'm going to ask, dear, do you have your, you have your microphone? Yes. Okay. Can everybody, can everybody hear? Hear. So. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So Vera, why don't you first just give us a couple minutes, a little bit on your history, where you come from, how did you end up in the camp, whatever, you know, give us a few minutes about your history growing up. I was born in 1935 in Steget, Hungary, uh, which is a university town in the southern part of Hungary. I went to the Jewish day school, which was the elementary school, and I don't know why or how or what, but all the Jewish children before me, my parents too, they all went to the Jewish day school. My father was a pharmacist, and my mother was a pianist. She taught piano at the conservatory, and she also worked as an assistant voice coach at the opera hall. In my house, there was always music, and we had a very happy home. My father's mother lived with us. And then in 1944, the Germans invaded Hungary. They didn't have to try very hard because the Hungarians were always very anti-Semitic, and they were very glad to have the Germans come and uh, occupy the country. And then the hardship started in the spring of 1944. I was eight and a half years old. They started to take away everything from us, including our freedom. We had to wear a yellow star. I remember having had a navy blue spring coat, and I asked my grandmother if she could probably color it yellow. So I, I, with the star wouldn't show up so badly. Uh, you couldn't hide in my hometown. In Budapest, which was a big city, some Jewish people were able to hide. But uh, in my hometown, everybody knew who was Jewish. And one day, they came to our apartment, uh, the Hungarians with requisitions, and they took away our belongings. We were just standing there and the thing that hurt my mother the most was when two ladies came and took away her piano. And then the Germans told us to pack a small suitcase and I have to say the Hungarians were very glad to help the Germans and pack some of our belongings and they took us to the ghetto. Now the ghetto in every city was an area that was close to the Jewish temple and they walled it in with barbed wire and they were putting the Jewish people in there. My hometown had over 5,000 Jewish people. The population of Seged was about the population of Savannah around 160,000. So it wasn't a large percentage of people that were Jewish. And then they put us in the ghetto, which was in that area surrounding the synagogue. And we were 10 to 11 to a room. We didn't have any opportunity to keep clean. And we didn't have much of any food or water. This is where our misery started. And from there, they took us to the outside of Seged, to a brick factory, 
where we slept on the floor and we had a latrine, which I hope you never saw or never will see. It's a hole in the ground where you could do your private business and I still remember mother holding me to keep me from falling in. And we were there about 10 days and then they put us into cattle cars and we were going and was 80 to 100 people in a cattle car. There was a bucket in the middle for your private business and that was the first time I saw people die from, from starvation, lack of water, older people started dying. And um, my mother asked my, fa my father, where are we going? And he said, I think we're going west. And we did, we ended up in a place in Austria where they let us out of the cattle cars called Strasshof. And there they started the selection process. Some people were going to Mauthausen, different camp, and it was very lucky for my family. We were put into a slave labor camp in a glass factory in Lower Austria, and the factory we worked in was called the Stölzle Glass Factory. I saw pictures of it recently. It's still there, it's much larger. And then we were put to work. I, as an eight and a half year old little girl, worked 12, 14 hours a day. I was working on a manual machine. There was hardly any electricity. It was toward the end of the war and the Germans were actually retreating. And I have to say, Hungary could have saved all the Jews but they very, they're very glad to get rid of the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, we were the last nation in uh, Eastern Europe and Middle Europe to be taken to the camp. The Polish people were in the camp for years already. And uh, my parents worked in the other part of the factory and lived in barracks which were not heated, we didn't have running water, we had to drive us outside, and slowly everybody got full of lice, and from lice people got typhoid fever. I had um, so much lice in my hair, my mother managed to shave my head, and my head was full of scabs which were oozing, and we were always hungry. And one day, the German officers came into the part of the factory my parents were working in, and they asked if anybody could play the piano, because they had no electricity, so they couldn't play a gramophone. In those days, that's how they had. And my mother, told them that she played the piano. She was thinking either I'm gonna play the piano or they're gonna cut my hand off. But my mother was a very interesting, a very brave woman, and she was really not afraid of anything. She also spoke fluent German. She spoke four languages. So she didn't have any problem speaking to the German. And after that, every night, she went to play the piano for the German officers. And for that, they used to give her some fruit and some cheese and some bread, which was a very big thing in our lives because we were working and always hungry. And mother used to come back to the barracks late at night and would wake me up and give me some of the food which was very fortunate because most people had severe malnutrition, including my parents, but I did not. And then uh, I'm trying to make it short because you're young people and I understand that you could lose interest. 
And then one day in the spring of 1945, whoever was still alive, they put us into cattle cars again, and the roads were bombed out, pretty much so, and they took us out of the cattle car and put us on a death march. If you couldn't walk, they would shoot you. And my grandmother was up in years, and she really had great difficulty moving by then, and she was skin and bones, and my mother carried her on her back. That's how she saved her life. And then they took us to the place you just see, to Terezin. And this was at the end of the war, in 45. The German Jewish people, a lot of them, and the Czechs were taken to Terezin at the beginning of the war. And the Hungarians were taken there at the end of the war. The Germans still were still hoping that they were going to be able to kill us. What Germany was really running was a death factory. They mainly manufactured dead Jewish people. That was the aim to kill as many as possible. And um, we didn't work much in Terezin. When we left Hungary, they took away my doll. I'm going to show you a picture of it after. And my mother put a little pillow in my hand and drew a picture of my doll on it. And she said, from now on, this is going to be your doll. And in Terezin, the Germans realized that they were going to pick up all kinds of disease from the Jewish people. And they took away every bit of our belongings, which was not much. We hardly had clothing or shoes or anything. And they disinfected everything. And then they threw it out in the middle of the barracks. The Terezin stadt is like this goes in a square, and little is a big courtyard. And I remember mother going there, and she saved me my little doll, the pillow, and she gave it back to me. And the 8th of May, we were liberated in Theresienstadt by the Red Army. That was the army of the Soviet Union. And uh, the Germans were running away. They were taking off the uniforms because if the Russians caught them, they shot them dead. And um, my father somehow arranged that we could go back to Hungary. He spoke Russian also between many other languages. And he talked to a Russian officer. And he took us back to Hungary on his truck. And we arrived in Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary. And my parents had a very good friend there. I still remember him, Francesco Canziani. And we went to their home. He had a Jewish wife. He was uh, an Italian, well, Austrian Italian. And uh, he managed to save his wife's life. And we uh, ended up moving in on them. They didn't have much of anything to eat either. But whatever little they had, they shared with us. And my mother, as always, took to the streets to see what she can find, who she can meet. She was a very interesting lady. I have very, loving, very many loving memories of my mother. And she managed to find that another Hungarian truck driver that decided for some money to take us back to Szeged. And we went back home, but we couldn't go back in our apartment because the Russian commander was in it. And we ended up in the same apartment where we were garrisoned in the ghetto, and that's where my parents restarted our life. 
And I remember one thing very clearly when my mother said to me, Vera, I want you to come with me. And she also had two police officers with her. And we went to an apartment in the city and um, my mother rang the doorbell and this lady opened the door and my mother said to her, you have my piano. And she said, I do not have your piano. And my mother said, yes, you do, let me in. And because she had the policeman with her, they had to let her in. And she opened up the piano and in the back of the piano, she put my father's business stamp. And she said, look at this. And the woman said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, so am I. And then she had a moving company with her next day, and she took her piano back. Now her piano meant a lot to her. She got it from her father on her 16th birthday. It was not just her greatest pleasure, it was also her way of making a very nice living uh, in a field which she thoroughly enjoyed. She was a musician to the core. She was also very eccentric in many ways because she was a typical musician. She worked at the opera house after the war again. And I have to say the Hungarians were not very happy to see us come back. And my mother did some other things. Some of the paintings we had, she put her name on the back of it. And she was, and she remembered who took what, and she was able to get back some of that too. Anyway, my parents restarted our life, and then came communism, which is just as bad as fascism. And then we had a new way of coping. And in 1956, we had a revolution in Hungary. And by then, I really had enough. And I left, uh, first I went to Austria, and then uh, to the United States, sure, sure. to Cleveland, Ohio, where I met my husband and married. We were married 55 years when he died. That's the bottom of the my story. What do you do for a living? What was your profession? I am a chemist, an analytical chemist. I worked at the Cleveland Clinic in uh, Cleveland. In Cleveland. Okay. <laughs> right. we're, still, we're still doing good with time. Let's see if there's a few questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Did any of your friends ever make it out of the concentration camps? Not too many. I was when we came back to Hungary. I was looking for one of my best friends, and then I heard that he died in Auschwitz. Can you speak German? Uh, I used to speak much better. I still understand a good bit, but I wouldn't say I speak it fluently anymore. Was it still hard for you even after the war was over? Um, well, it wasn't too hard because my parents gave me a very good balance, but I had to just too many things. One of them was losing a lot of my friends. And then uh, I made some new friends, a few Jewish and quite a few Christian. How was the education after the war? Oh, I went back to school. I lost a year during the war, but I made up for it. In fact, I got ahead uh, two years. What were the concentration camps? <laughs> there was real Nazis. And um, then we had the Austrian work that worked there. And I have to say that the, some of the Austrian workers were not bad to us. I wouldn't say they loved us, but Austrians are equally anti-Semitic, but they were not nearly as bad. And if you stopped working and one of the German officers saw you, they would hit you. So when we use the word anti-Semitic, you've heard that from Vera a couple of times. That word, that's a word that means you don't like Jewish people. 
So it's a special term that when you say that, you're referring to, I don't like Jews, just because they're Jewish. Not because they did anything, but that's what the term means. Let's have just a couple more questions. Where are we? Go ahead. What were the four languages that your mom spoke? What were the four languages that your mom spoke? Oh, my mother spoke number one, Hungarian, German, French, and Italian. She had to speak French and Italian in order to teach uh, at the upper house. How long were you in the concentration camps? So how long were you in, in the camp? The one slave? year. One year. So when you say slave labor camp, why do you use the word slave? Because we didn't get paid. We didn't get anything for our work. And you were there against your will? Yes, uh, we were slaves. Okay. And uh, if I may say something, the Jewish people are called Semite, and that's where the word against right. Jews, anti-Semite came from. Why did you guys just take off the stars? Why did you just take off the stars? Dear, why didn't you just, when they made you wear the stars, why did you just rip it off? Why did you, why did you keep them on? Because they would know you're Jewish in your hometown anyhow. Some people did rip it off, but if they caught you, they killed you. So can you imagine, she says, you could, you could rip it off, but because if you were living in a small city, you knew who the Jewish people were. So if you ripped it off, she says, and I think it's a fact, you're done. I mean, they just take you out with a rifle and just, that's it. There were some other questions. Yeah. How did you sleep at night? How did you sleep at night? I was a child. And, uh, I was able to sleep at night. Uh, they mean not. Then? Then. Yeah, I was a child. Did you have bad dreams? Oh, yes. Do you remember any of your bad dreams? Uh, some of my bad dreams were that I was running and they caught me and they killed me. Did you hear that? So she was, her, some of her dreams were that she was running from the Nazis and they called her and they killed her. That's a nightmare. Okay, anything else? We're good? Okay. One last, what, where, where am I? Time, okay. So let me do this. Next, I, first of all, one more time, please. Yes, you are. Steve Nadell, uh -huh. tell us what you have brought us to show. Okay. And also tell us, just a brief yeah. what do you have in common with Vera? Okay, okay. I was born in 1945. The war was just about over. I survived because my mother was pregnant with me, and she survived only by a small, small miracle. Around uh, about 1944, she was put on the last transport out of Budapest to be taken to the camp. She was lucky that she was the last transport. In 1945, in January, the Russians were already getting ready to come into, into Budapest and Hungary. As the train was leaving uh, Hungary, the Russian soldiers stopped the, the train and turned it around. They said, no more train will be leaving Hungary. My mother was on that train. She came back to Budapest. She went, went, went back to the ghetto in Budapest. And that's where I grew up. I grew up in the ghettos of Budapest. And I was born in 1945. By that time, uh, the Russians were in charge. And uh, my mother used to say, they ran up to the Russian soldiers and said, Thank God you're here to save us. And a Russian soldier would say, we didn't come here to save you. 
he came over here to occupy. And the first group of Russian soldiers were the lowest of the lowest soldiers they could find. Because the Russians would put all the low, uh, what they call uh, not educated soldiers in the front, and all the educated soldiers were in the back. So whoever got killed in the front, it wasn't no matter to them. So when they came into Budapest, the only thing they wanted is two things. Where is the vodka? They couldn't find vodka, they would drink perfume. If they didn't have perfume, they would drink kerosene. They could care less. They, they were basically dead people as far as the, the Russians were concerned. In 1945, when I was born, for, for whatever reason, my mother gave me my first name, which is a Russian name. I don't know why she did that. My name is Ivan Nader. And when I came to the United States, in 1956, when we escaped uh, the revolution, when we came to the United States in, in, in New York, my cousin said to me, you need a new name. You don't need to be called by, by Ivan. What name would you like? And she picked out a name for me. So today my name is Stephen Lavelle. And that's how I became dead. Now, uh, uh, I remember uh, them telling me, which is very critical to me, as we, we lived in the ghetto, uh, still wasn't that good, but at least we had a place to stay. My sister in 19, November of 1944, before I was born, she was 11 years old, my brother was six years old, and during the coldest time of November, at about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, when it was cold and getting dark, they marched him to the Danube, which is the river in Hungary, and there was maybe about 50 little kids was marched towards the, uh, the river to be shot into the river. What happened was, luckily, my sister is still alive, my brother is still alive, as they were uh, basically uh, taken over there to, to the river, it got too dark, and the two soldiers that was guiding them said, you know something, it's getting dark, they are cold, they are hungry, why don't we just go ahead, take them back to the ghetto, and we'll kill, kill uh, all of these kids tomorrow. Luckily, they forgot to come back for them. So my sister survived, my brother survived, my father was in, in a, uh, uh, he, he was in a forced labor, but not in a camp, he was a forced labor cooking for the Hungarian Nazis. I want you to remember, when you say Nazis, it doesn't always mean German Nazis. Nazis could be Hungarian Nazis, Austrian Nazis, Polish Nazis. Nazis are Nazis regardless of what country they were from. Yeah. Yes. At this time, I want to show you some of the artifacts that came out of the camps. And these are some of the things that, that we found uh, over the years. And this is basically a shirt that uh, somebody in the camp would wear. And this is the real, real stuff. This is a real shirt. And it, you see that, uh, that they also had a star uh, which in, in different colors. They had about 10 different colored stars depending on if you were Jewish, if you were a political prisoner, or if you were a, uh, as, as, as the Nazis said, gay, uh, if you were uh, other than a, a normal person that would put a star with a different color on there too. So when, when the guards would look at you, they would know who you are right away. And that's what the shirt that, uh, this represents coming out of the camps. Uh, I don't know which camp this one came from, but uh, as you can see, there's, there's a, a star that was made in two different colors. Uh, the, 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 next, the next item is, is, as you could see in the pictures that you've seen earlier, when, when you left your country, you took your possessions with you. And this particular lady came out of Holland, and she put her name on it so, so she could identify your bag, because they thought that the, the, that the Nazis would allow you to keep your bag. But it, it, it technically, when you got to the camps, the first thing they took away from you is all your goods. So this lady, we, we, we do not know for sure, 
if she survived the war or not, but she came out of Holland, and as you could see, there's a Jewish star on there, and her name, and, uh, and, uh, and when, when she was born. Thinking that she will recover this item later on after the war, and most likely she never survived. Now this person over here, this is a very expensive doctor's bag. Most people would not have an expensive bag like this. This particular person came out of Dachau, and what we found out through the internet, by, by having this, this number over here, is that th this person went to Dachau, which is a concentration camp in Germany, and uh, he was a 19-year-old, possibly a, 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 a student at, at 19 years old, you couldn't be a doctor, I don't think, but I think he, he was starting to become a doctor. And, and this was in Dachau, and we found out that he survived three months in Dachau before he was killed. And this was on the internet, and you could, you could trace it by these numbers. And there's also a Jewish star on top, so we know who owned this bag and where he was. Yeah, just to let you know that in, while I was in the army, I was stationed not far away from Dachau. So, uh, so one day when we went to Austria for, for a day trip, on the way back, I said to my, my wife, let's go to Dachau, since we are passing by right there. We'll never see it again, let's go in there. This was 1956, 20 years after the war, and we got to Dachau, and it looked like a camp for, for kids. That we built the camp partially, and it was 20 years after the war, but you could still smell the ovens where they burnt the body. You could still smell it, and they couldn't hide it. And I see the, 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 the tracks over there in Dhaka, and, and when the people were, were told in Dhaka, at the city of Dhaka, that they didn't know about the concentration camp, and we all know it was a lie. Everybody knew it. Yeah, okay. Uh, then, then we got a, a, a couple of uh, armbands. This is something that you would wear, not in the camps, but somewhere on the street, uh, to show you that, that you were Jewish. And technically, they, they wanted these stars to be uh, on, on your arm or, or sewn on, on, onto your shirt to hu hu humiliate you. This is a humiliation to say that, hey, everybody knows you're a Jew, stay away from them. So this was not a, a, a good thing to have. Here is, an, uh, now this was born in the camps, as you can see, instead of a star, they, they had, sometimes they had just, just a triangle in different colors. This, this triangle, I don't know exactly what it represents, uh, or, or this, uh, but it was some type of a, a person that would, would make other people's work. In other words, he was also a prisoner, but yet he would uh, make other people work because if he didn't do it, they would probably kill him anyway. So he had this uh, on his own band. And then lastly, my friend, whose father, was a soldier in 1944-45, and he was a stamp collector. So he goes into the camp to liberate the camp as an American soldier. He goes into the camps and he gets this, he goes to the post office of the camp. He can't find any stamps. So he finds this document with a stamp on it, and he grabbed everything he could. He took about 200 of these at one time, and he brought it back to his, to, to his son. His son gave it to me. Out of 200, I got maybe about 50 of these. And these documents shows that what the camp was collecting, monies and goods, and they sent, and this is a voucher that sends money to Berlin for the war effort. And that's what these represent, these documents and vouchers. Okay. You uh, you look like somebody's mom. I am somebody's mom. So what is your connection here? Tell so, us. So uh, first of all, thank you all so much for having me today. Your questions are amazing. You all are fantastic. I appreciate so much that you've invited me here today. My grandparents, Sarah and David, survived Auschwitz. At the time of the war, they were married to other people. They had children. They lost those children. They were Polish Jews. Uh, my grandmother lived near Warsaw.
So like Miss Vera, she spoke many languages. Um, she had a very different life than my grandfather, who served in the Polish Navy, but went back to his small town, Ozerkov, after his uh, time in the Navy. And he was from a family of tailors, very, very modest people. But uh, they were married to other people. At the time of the Lodge Ghetto, where they were stripping Jews of their businesses and their homes, they rounded them up. And they were both in the Lodge Ghetto. And I know even the houses where they lived, because the Germans would take a census. They knew who lived where. And I have, if you want to see later, I have those um, documents. I was able to find it on the internet. I know that 13 members of my grandfather's family lived in one apartment, uh, including his wife and his daughter, his uncle, uh, other family members. I know that my grandmother lived in one apartment with her husband, her two daughters, and her in-laws. I know that her two daughters in 1942 were ages five and seven, and they were taken away from her and sent to Auschwitz. I know that several years later, she herself then went to Auschwitz, as did my grandfather. Uh, I don't know, I haven't found the records of the year that they were transported, um, but I will continue to search until I find it. They may have been there up to two years. My grandmother survived because she spoke German. She was doing slave labor, laying railroad ties. When they learned that she could speak German, they brought her inside to an office where she <coughs> typed memos for an SS officer. And just because she could come inside and work, she lived. My grandfather had learned some electrical work in the Navy, and so he was able to survive because they needed his skills for building. And that's how he survived, but everyone else was lost. They did not know one another, but after the war, they went to Boras, Sweden, into a Red Cross refugee camp. That is where they met. And they had to work for the Swedish government, and I have their workbooks, where every day they went to work, it was stamped. And they would get a modest stipend, but that paid for their housing and their food and everything while they regained their health. Uh, they were in Sweden for six years. It is where my mother was born. In 1951, they moved to the United States. They emigrated. They became citizens here um, and, uh, until, until they passed away. Um, that is my living history. Thank you so much for letting me share it with you. I appreciate it. I just want you to know, faculty, that uh, you have made. I know you know this, but now I see this. The questions uh, are so many. Your kids are you must be very proud of your students. They ask good questions, and I wish we had time for more questions. You can choose to have those discussions with your students afterwards. I don't know what the answer to why people do those things to each other. Why are people, um, I don't have the answer to why people do horrible things like that. Why kill people just because they are who they are? Why? Jewish, this color, that color, this faith, all I can tell you is, let's ask the questions because we can all share the questions. And if we learn the ripples of history, we'll be wiser. And you know what? You can make a difference. Because when you grow up to be the age of your parents and your teachers, you may be asked to make a decision to help somebody else. And that could make the difference between saving a life. Because you, what you do really matters in this world. Saving a life. So guess what? Every student after where you leave here is going to get this very cool wristband that comes from the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which is a place I hope you will go and visit. And it says, what you do matters. When you put this on and your friends ask you, what is that? How will you answer them? How will you tell them about this experience? There's a lot more knowledge to get that you'll learn from your teachers, that you can read books, you can watch movies. And there are so many stories Stories, stories. Every person has a story. 
how do we make our world better? We start by listening to the stories. So let us remember and show respect as we conclude by, by um, lighting these candles. There are six candles. I'm going to ask Ms. Pinckney to uh, give us six students, and we will light one for each, believe it or not, million of people who were murdered. Six million Jewish people were murdered because they were Jewish. So if we could get six people to come forward, and I'm going to ask the teachers to pass those out. And excellent. We want to give everybody why don't you stand on this part? Move around back here. And we're going to let you listen to a song, which you have the words in front of you, which is a song that was uh, based on a, uh, a diary from a 15-year-old boy named 15-year-old and who was <coughs> never, who was taken to Auschwitz concentration camp, but afterwards they found in the camp those words that he had written and uh, were found under his uh, bunk or his uh, whatever in the floorboard where people kept diaries and they didn't make it. And it's called The Last Butterfly. So I'm going to ask if we could all be quiet, follow the words, watch the candles lit, and be respectful of the memories of 6 million, 1.5 million children die.